Father Edwin Leonard is our first speaker. And Father Edwin, of course, is the pastor of this parish and has been for about a year now. On June 2nd of this year, he's going to celebrate his 10th year as a Catholic priest. He has served at St. Rita Parish. Yeah, God bless you. He has served at St. Rita Parish. He's been at St. Michael the Archangel in McKinney. He's been at St. William the Confessor in Greenville. And also for seven years, he was vocation director of the Diocese of Dallas. And during that time, he was uh, able to help 80 men enter into seminary formation. He also went through the NET ministries. And he's just an amazing man, amazing pastor. And it's quite an honor for him to get us kicked off today. So with no further ado, Father Edwin Leonard. Thank you, Father. I have a confession to make. I know that's a little bit backwards. Um, Catholic jokes. Um, so I have an addiction to coffee. I mean, it's, it's bad. Every morning I have like a, a pre-coffee before as I'm brewing my French press of coffee. And I am, uh, I measure my intake of caffeine by uh, grams, not milligrams. And so, uh, and I know, I know if like, I know what I need to manage so that I don't get a headache. Like I firmly believe that coffee is medicine um, because it staves off. And we are way past the point in time where it makes me alert. It's just getting me to a baseline of like not being mean. And so uh, I know that if I am not at home, like I normally have my French press and then I like brew my shot of espresso while my French press is brewing. But, but if I'm not at home, I know that I need like a cup of coffee has 125 milligrams of caffeine. I know that if I don't have coffee, uh, green tea has 25 milligrams of caffeine. I know that black, uh, black tea has 75 milligrams of caffeine, and I will manage my caffeine intake for the day. And so what you also need to know is that Father Edwin is not a morning person. But for some reason, the church likes things in the morning. Like, why? 7 a.m. Mass? There's other times. <laughs> but I graciously get up and do this Mass. And so as, as many of you may know, as Catholics, we believe that the Eucharist, the, the holy sacrifice of the Mass where we receive the Eucharist, that it is actually Jesus. It's actually his body, his blood, his soul, and divinity. And so the church asks us, and just to notice this, to give a little head nod uh, that Jesus is present, it asks for us to fast um, before Mass. Now, it used to be that you had to fast from the entire night before, um, but we've kind of slacked off on that a little bit. Now you only have to fast an hour before reception of the Eucharist. So that means on Sunday, just don't eat as you're driving to church. Um, but if you are going to be going to a daily Mass, daily Mass is much quicker, so you have to fast like 45 minutes um, before the Mass starts. And so this is a problem because I don't like waking up early in the morning, and so I'm just like driving into that sacristy, getting vested uh, like three minutes before Mass starts. And I don't have time to brew my coffee. And so I had gone through an entire Mass, uh, gave a homily, read the Gospel, consecrated the Eucharist, no coffee, right? And then I am like running late to a meeting that happens right after that. And so I I am like, I take my shot of espresso, I'm waiting for my French press to brew, I'm already running late, and so I have like my coffee cup, my iPad, and my French press that I am like trying to run across the parking lot over here um, to the back door. But because it's so early, um, our, our doors have a, an electronic lock, and the electronic lock is in my wallet back here. And so, but here I am, I have my iPad, I have my French press, I have my coffee cup, and no hands to reach and get the pocket to unlock the door. And so I try to do this little thing where like I, I unlock by just <laughs> getting the key card close. Didn't work um, because I would spill my coffee. And so I have this great idea. I take the iPad, 
right? And I put the French press and the coffee cup on top of it. Like, I was a waiter back in the day at Papado's. So, like, I, I feel like I had some skills. And so I, I take the, the French press and the coffee mug, and I put it on here. I reach in my back pocket. I uh, zap the door. I unlock it. I open it up, and I walk on through. And I'm just walking with this iPad um, as a tray and holding my French press, thinking, man, this is a pretty good tray. Brothers, this is not a tray. <laughs> like, you can run the world with an iPad, right? You can, uh, you can do your taxes. You can read every book imaginable. You can take university classes. You can communicate from one end of the world to the other in seconds. And I was using it as a tray. That is not what this is for. It's a good tray, it functioned just fine. It met the needs of a tray. But it's not what it was meant for. That's what I think is the problem with the world today. In the world, we view men a certain way. We are living out our masculinity so lowly. You are not a tray. Stick with me. You're an iPad. You are meant for more. The world tells us um, so often now that being a man uh, is, is bad, right? It, there's these terms, toxic masculinity. It, it doesn't want you to be more masculine. It wants you to be less masculine. And I think that's a problem. It's a misunderstanding of who God created us to be. If you have your scriptures with you, which you probably don't, because hashtag Catholics, um, I'm not going to get up on my soapbox today, um, but I do want you to move in, into, your, into the word of God and look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. It says in the beginning he created the male and female. And then in the same place he pronounces this creation good and very good. Who you are as a man is important. You have a very specific sphere and influence, a way in which the Lord is calling and is going to use you. He created you um, to be something specific. He created the sexes in the world, male and female, to be complementary so that um, we can use each other's gifts and graces um, to the praise and glory of his name. That is how life comes into the world. And so... I would say that the problem is, is not that masculinity is toxic. It's the fact that we are not living according to God's plan in nature. When the world turns away from God's plan, things stop working. He wrote the manual. That is the problem. Men are not living as men. They're living at best like the animal, ruled by their passions. It is important to note that because of sin, in Genesis, at the very beginning, what God proclaimed to be very good is now wounded. The word in Catholicism that we use to express this is concupiscence, that each and every one of us is wounded. Now, I, I don't think that we have to go very far um, into this to recognize that our hearts want things that aren't good for us. Concupiscence means that our will and our intellect no longer, or our, our intellect no longer drives our will. Our will and our desires are driving us. Our passions have become unruly. 
St. Paul describes this in Romans chapter 7. He says, the good that I want to do, I do not do. And the evil that I want to avoid, I choose. The problem is, is that we are living out of this weakness and woundedness. This heart that wants things that are not good for us. In the world, the flesh and the devil, and the devil is real. There is a malignant spirit in the world. That he has a plan uh, for the world, and the world is believing it. And because we are part of the world, and because we have this uh, wounded flesh, uh, oftentimes we have systems and patterns of belief that have already been integrated within ourselves um, that follow after the pathway of the evil one. We have lies ingrained within us. But the remedy is to be the man that God wants us to be. The world wants you to be less, not more. And so we have to be intentional about this. How do I see this within the world? Um, You see so much disorderedness um, in in every aspect, but if we just look at um, the way that the world uh, looks at sex and procreation and marriage, Uh, It is very wounded. Uh, We will teach uh, young men today, uh, the world will, to make sure that um, before they do anything with a member of the opposite sex to get consent. They will teach them, um, don't, don't force yourself upon somebody else. That is wrong. And those things are true. but it's not enough. What the Lord does is he teaches a value and the world does this too. It says this is right and this is wrong. But where the world falls short is it forgets to teach virtue. It teaches the value, this is bad and this is good, but it doesn't ever teach virtue virtue. It doesn't ever say we need to discipline ourselves. We need to strive after the Lord. We need to have a firm habit towards the good. Maybe you are far off um, from the Lord Maybe this is a moment that you've, you've taken a step. You came to this North Texas Men Conference. Um, but we have to make choices towards the good. And the more that you choose the good, the easier that it gets to choose the good. The more that you even don't even have to think about the good. But the opposite is also true. If you continue to choose evil, it wears a pathway in the ground, this mental pathway in your mind, and you can just start this over and over again. Now, the way that uh, habits work in modern kind of psychology and neuroscience, we've come to realize, have you ever heard someone say, you know, it takes 40 days to break a habit? Have you guys heard that before? Um, That's not actually true. Um, You don't break habits anymore, the way that we think about it now in this new paradigm. And you might have experienced this before. Uh, You've thought that you've had some victory over sin and temptation, and then all of a sudden you just fall right back into it. You guys ever had that happen before? Amen. Great, you're a man. Everyone has. Um, The reason why is as we choose evil, it's right there. We wear a pathway in the ground, this rut that we follow. When you choose the good, you're not, mentally, you're not really able to fill in that pathway. What you do is you just trace, you start choosing a new pathway, a better pathway. And then you have to pick, then you have to choose and start to make barriers so you don't fall back into your old habits. Why is this important today? Because you are going to have an opportunity to receive God's grace in so many manifold ways. But you're going to have to choose it. We're going to have the sacrament of reconciliation available. 
Someone uh, the other day went, uh, came to me for confession, and they had lived a life, a life that was not in keeping with the Lord, very far away. They had been away for a long time, and they came back, uh, and as a penance, I gave them a decade of the rosary and a scripture passage to read. And they were like, is that it? Shouldn't I have to do more? And I was like, no. If you spent your entire life wearing nothing but sackcloth and ashes, never eating anything but bread and water, crawling on rocks on, with your knees wherever you went, if you slept on a bed of nails, if you flogged yourself at every moment as a penance, it still would not be anything compared to the forgiveness that God offers you. You do not earn it. You we do not deserve it. But he gives it. The son died for you on the cross. And that's what opens up. The penance is just a way in which we walk and say, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to take this medicine um, to show that I am repentant and faithful. It is not meant to earn the forgiveness. Jesus already did that. But you're going to have the opportunity to go to confession. But what I want for you in confession is for you not to just seek forgiveness. I want you to, res I want you to seek freedom. Far too often as Catholics, we fall into this rut of going to confession, sinning, going to confession, sinning, going to confession. And oftentimes, what can even happen at this moment is we can say, oh, I'll go ahead and sin. I know I have time to go to confession Saturday morning. That is a lie from the devil. Yes, the Lord will forgive you, but who's winning in that moment? The evil one. Because he is placing chains upon you. The Lord in his mercy will give you forgiveness, but you are not choosing freedom if that is your mentality. The evil one is perfectly okay with you going to confession on Saturday because he is a betting man and he will, uh, he says, I know that they'll sin Sunday through Saturday because I've enslaved them. And in this weird way, God's mercy becomes part of the problem because we're treating it as something not important. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe it's verse 18, says, we all with unveiled, or the Spirit of the Lord is there as freedom, and we all with unveiled faces, beholding God are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. When we invite the Spirit, God doesn't just want to forgive us. He wants to change us into him. He wants us to see him, and he wants us to be transformed. He wants us to be free. He wants us to be able to say yes to him at every single moment. The world wants too little. You know what is right and wrong. But have you been choosing the virtue have you been allowing the Lord to strengthen you by your continued choices? There are a couple things that I want to talk about today um, that can really help us to choose the Lord. Uh, the first of which, um, you guys are going to be anointed, you guys are going to be sent out, you guys are going to be entrusted with a mission. By the very fact that God has brought you here, he is going to send you out. Second Corinthians chapter one says that the Lord of all consolation consoles us in the midst of our difficulties so that there's a purpose. The reason why he heals us, the reason why he helps us to overcome that wound of concupiscence, the reason why you know Jesus is yes for you, but he says so that you, when you find somebody else in any difficulty, that you can console them with the consolation you have received. That as we have been healed with Jesus, as we know where the doctor and the physician is, we are meant to go and tell people about it. It's not enough just to sit back. 
And so there's a couple of things, since I have an attentive audience right now, um, I want to speak about something that tears men down probably more often uh, than anything else. And it is, a, uh, it is not necessarily a root cause, but it is a way in which sin is flourishing in the world. And so I want you to have resources. Um, there, uh, and I'm speaking about this. There is an evil that uh, is in our world, pornography. And I think that all men at some point in time in their lives have struggled with this. But it is something that we struggle with in guilt and shame, and we never bring it to the light. We might confess it in the confessional, but never allow um, the real Lord. We might even say that we have an addiction to it. But if you have an addiction to anything else, if you had an addiction to alcohol, if you were an alcoholic, what would you do? You'd go get yourself in a 12-step program, right? You, you would stop going to bars. If you were serious about your faith and receiving help, a lot of times uh, with pornography, a lot of men just don't know how to get help, right? They don't see a 12-step program as something that is important. I have a website that I want, every, I want everyone to take out your phone. If you have a smartphone with you, take it out right now. Um, because even if you don't struggle with this problem, um, I do think that you know someone who does, and you will be able to help them. This was made by a friend of mine, uh, Father Greg Gearhart, um, from, uh, he, was, he was at Texas A&M, and, and now is the vocation director of Austin. What I love about this, his mercyendures.org, it has a tab that says find freedom. It has four um, helpful habits on how to um, fight against this particular sin. Uh, it talks about uh, software. It talks about accountability partners. It talks about knowing yourself, recognizing the wound, uh, and then doing, being able to do this. I want, as men, for us to be able to find freedom, not just forgiveness. Forgiveness is too short-sighted. The Lord wants you to be free from sin, uh, and this will be able to help, and you will be able to share this with someone because the Lord is going to bring people into your life as you experience healing. Uh, you just click the tab that says Find Freedom, and there's four areas to kind of look at. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, but the Lord does have a, a plan for us, a plan for us to be able to find freedom. Now, how do we do this? Now, the Lord in his uh, manifold wisdom uh, never meant for us to do these things by ourselves. Uh, Jesus Christ, when he was, we just finished Lent. How many people went to the Stations of the Cross? Very powerful, wonderful. Um, in the Stations of the Cross, how did Jesus do carrying his cross? Was he perfect in it? Great. No, he was not. Um, Jesus Christ, who is God, right, all-powerful God who created all things, um, fell with his cross. Uh, I think he did so on purpose. He became man, and so he showed us that we're not always going to be perfect. But what Jesus Christ did is he carried his cross. He did not set it aside. As men, there are times within our lives that we are not carrying our cross. We are setting it aside. Um, whether or not that be with pornography and masturbation, whether that be with allowing contraception into our marriages and family, whether or not we're allowing our hearts to be hardened as we drive past a homeless person uh, and we just ignore them, whether or not we have gifts and talents and we are just uh, too busy to even try to see if maybe God wants to use them for the praise and glory of his name within the church. How many of you at Mass today, who is at Mass? Was everyone at Mass today? Who is there? Great. How many of you loved when I said, the Lord be with you? Okay, that was a little lame. But at Mass today, wasn't it on fire? I mean, when you were there and like you heard all of the other men singing and responding, didn't it make you want to be louder didn't you recognize how often within our churches that tone and timber is missing? That's why it's good that we gather together. Because we inspire each other. I don't know what it is. Because you guys are at masses. But when we're not together, when we're not huddled together... We just drowned in. We're like, the Lord be with you, with your spirit. 
our response then needs to be this. Jesus Christ, who carried his cross, he fell. And then the Romans said, they grabbed this random guy and they brought him to Jesus. And Jesus, they were united in the struggle of the cross. And this guy named Simon the Cyrene came to know Jesus. It was only through a mutual sharing of struggles of the cross that Simon came to know Jesus in a deeper way. And guess what happened? It wasn't just for Simon. Simon's sons become the leaders of the early church. Alexander and Rufus. Can you believe that? Men gathering together, sharing a common struggle with Jesus, taking up their cross, radiates throughout their world and their family to where other people become holy just because we are gathering together. This, is not, should, be, this should not be a surprise. After we are seeking the Lord, not just seeking forgiveness, but we're seeking freedom, as we are seeking to move from glory to glory to allow the Lord to restore the image, in sin, the image is distorted. And when we spend time choosing virtue, not just saying what's good and bad, but when we choose virtue, he restores that image and he shines through us. And as we gather together, we are strengthened We need to be gathering together more often as men. And we need to be sharing things that are spiritual. I love watching a game, grabbing a beer, and hanging out with guys. It is beautiful, it is wonderful, but again, it is not enough. It is a tray, not the iPad. In Luke chapter 5, there's this story. There are these men. There's one that's paralyzed. He's on a mat. And he's got these four friends. And they carry him to Jesus. Do you have a set of friends that carry you towards Jesus? Now here's my question. Do you share with them your problems? The four men knew that their friend was paralyzed. But far too often as men, we don't want to let people know that we are hurting, that we are wounded, that we are managing sin and carrying a cross. We say, everything's good. I'm strong. How are your friends ever going to be able to carry you to Jesus if we are not being intentional about letting them see our weakness and vulnerability and intimacy. This is going to take an intentional choice because we don't choose it. And then are we surrounding ourselves with men that are worthy of that intimacy and vulnerability? That when we share our wounds with them, that they're going to take us to Jesus. Now, if you are in this room and you're thinking to yourself, I don't think any of those men exist. They do. You might not know them yet. But I want you to go to your church. Look at the men that are um, singing, that are responding loudly. Look at the men that have gone on chirp, that have been in acts, the ones that are serving. And I want you to surround yourself by them. This is what the early church does. Uh, it said, and we are it's here at St. Anne's, we love Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We have our youth nights. We call them 242 nights. Um, do you know Acts 242? It says that when the Holy Spirit, the Pentecost, came down and uh, transformed the world. <laughs> Crazy. Um, that 3,000 people became Catholic that day. And it says they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles, to the breaking of the bread, to fellowship, and to prayer. I'm willing to bet that most people here go to Mass. That's the breaking of the bread. I'm willing to bet that at some point in time you're trying to learn a little bit about your faith. But far too often, um, our faith becomes an academic exercise um, in just going to Mass rather than bringing the best of ourselves to Mass. And so what we need to really, I think, be intentional about is not the academic exercise because we're really comfortable with that. 
and we're really comfortable with maybe going to Mass one hour a week, we need to have fellowship. We need to surround ourselves with other men. You need to be praying for that. You need to be placing yourself in areas where that is possible. Make the choice. And maybe you have to be the witness who starts to share. The second thing that we need to be doing is praying. I know that that sounds easy. I know that people say it all the time. But I hear um, in the confessional all the time, I am so busy, I haven't been praying. Or then like I'll hear someone say, I've been doing really good um, in my faith life, but all of a sudden, I just fell back into that old sin. Whatever it is. Anger, unforgiveness, lust, drinking, lying. And my next follow-up question is always the same. How's your prayer time? Uh, not, not good. So if you don't pray, I want you to listen to this. This is an easy style of prayer. It's called three-by-three three prayer. Um, and I think that it opens up a way in which to allow us to start to notice um, these areas of vulnerability, what the Lord's doing within our life, and be able to express it to our friend group. The first thing I want you to do, uh, three minutes, three things, add this into your prayer time if you don't have, actually have a prayer time. But you need to be doing it exclusively. You can't be doing it while you're, doing, while you're driving a car, Right? Um, we want to give God the best of our life. Like you'll notice in the Old Testament when, you, when they asked for a sacrifice, what did the Lord ask for? He asked for an unblemished lamb uh, that had no broken bones. Um, that's, how, that's what he asked for for the Passover sacrifice. Why did he do that? Because he knows us, right? He knows like, man, lambs and goats, those are expensive. I put a lot of money into this thing. God's asking for a sacrifice. What am I going to give him? Well, there's that one that has the plague and has a broken right foot. I'll sacrifice that one. Do not give God your plague-ridden broken leg time. If that's all you have, fine. God will take what he can get. But I'm willing to bet we have time if the world has enough time for social media and Wordle, it has enough time to pray. It has enough time to pray. Give the Lord that best time. Not the plague sheep with the broken foot. Carve out a time of your day. Um, I was a chaplain at a high school, and so I would hang out with the football team a lot. And after they played a game, uh, what, what would they do immediately? Uh, win or lose, they would watch tape of the game. And they would look at the things, they would review what they did well and how they um, didn't do so well. I want us to do that. The first thing you do by a three by three prayer is you review your day. And I don't want you just to review the, the failures. As men, we're great at this. I'm the worst, I'm awful, um, I can't do anything right. Don't do that. You're a beloved son of God. And God is operative at every moment of your day. If God stopped thinking about you, you would not exist. And no one would even know. So by the very fact that you are sitting in that pew, in a very uncomfortable wood pew, um, God is loving you into existence. And so if that is true, as we review our day, we look not only for our failings, but we look also for our blessings. We tell the Lord, I'm sorry for the areas in which not only did I purposely sin, but what were the areas in which I was unattentive to you holding me in existence and perhaps missed opportunities, allowing him to show you, hey, I really did want you um, to go talk to that guy. When that guy told you that he was having a difficult day, and you just said, well, that sucks, and then walked away. I wanted you to tell him about me and about how I help you often. Then I want you to notice the blessings and say thank you. Now, so they review the tape, and they see the good things, and they notice the bad, and then they, uh, they learn from it. Then, so we learn from it, then what they do is they uh, look at the tape, they scout the team that they're going to play that next Friday. And they look at their weaknesses, and they look at their strengths. So I want you to plan for the next day. So we review, and then we plan. 
want you to look at the next day and I want you to run through it and I want you to say, God, where do you want to be in my schedule? This is not my schedule, it's yours. Also, I know that my Tuesday meeting at 9.30, I always have a difficult time loving people and so I want you to help me to love those people. I know that I have a difficult time uh, when I get home from work. I've worked all hard all day, and I know that I'm supposed to help take care of my kids and be there present, loving them, asking them questions, and all these things. But sometimes I just want to go off into a room and not t- talk to anybody and recharge for a little bit. Help me to live out my vocation in love. As we do this, you're going to find strength in the given day. And then finally, I want you to pray for the people that are in your sphere of influence. So we review, we plan, we pray. God has given you, as men, an area in which you have specific spiritual power and influence. First your family, then your friend group, and then where you work. In your church community. Pray into those areas. Serve those areas. Pray for them. Did you know that if... uh, there's a multi-generational study uh, that, said, that shows how important men are. And this is nothing new. The scriptures testify this all the time. Did you know that if, um, a, if the mother is the one who drives and pushes people towards religion, do you know what the likelihood that their children will receive the faith and follow Jesus? It's about 12 to 15 percent. Do you know what the percentage is if the father is the one that is the spiritual leader in the household. It's like 92, 95% that the children will have faith in Jesus. The world needs you. It needs you to be men that seek virtue, not just knowing the good and the bad. It's not enough to just know the good and bad. We have to seek virtue. It needs you to be men that seek freedom, not just forgiveness. And it needs you to be together, which means that you need to be letting your friends and the people surrounding you, searching for other men that can just enliven and make you on fire as we have been today at Mass. And we need to share, the way that we do this is purposely sharing our weaknesses, and we need to be aware of our weaknesses because we're going to the Lord every day allowing the Lord who loves us to shine light in that area. This is what it takes. The world needs men. The world needs us. The Lord created them male and female, and it is good. But sometimes what we're living is too little. It's not the tray, it's the iPad. You are meant for more. Choose it. And when you turn, you will find the Lord is already there. Amen.